Hi, and welcome back to the Sociology of Law. This is week two, where we begin investigating the effects of case structure, meaning the social structure of a legal case. And our topic today is the behavior of law. So the core question in this section is what explains variation across legal cases? And we talked the first week about types of variation, and then we began talking about what explains variation. So some of the background to the theory we're going to cover today is legal realism. Legal realism, as you remember, made the argument that legal rules alone are insufficient to explain all the variation in outcomes. That is, you could have cases that, according to the rules, are technically similar. The behavior of the crime was the same, the evidence was the same, and the relevant statutes were the same. Therefore, they should have the same outcome, and yet they don't. Depending on various factors, cases get handled differently, even when the facts of the case, the ones that are supposed to be legally relevant facts anyway, are the same. Legal realism actually led to a lot of empirical research on law in modern society. Legal scholarship in the U.S. has always had this empirical focus, and so in the 20th century, researchers in law began to amass a great deal of scholarship on how cases are actually handled. So it is a growing body of facts about the handling of cases in modern America. Another bit of background to the theory we're going to cover today is legal anthropology. The field of anthropology, which traditionally has studied human behavior in tribal and village settings and more traditional types of societies, legal anthropology studied the way people in these settings used law and how law affected their lives and what their patterns of legal interaction were. For example, you had the legal anthropologist Laura Nader, who was a leading figure in this subfield, and she studied law in places like Native American villages in Mexico and rural villages in Turkey and discovered patterns in the way people used the courts in these societies. So legal anthropologists were also developing this body of knowledge about how law actually works, only they specialized in tribal, village, and foreign societies instead of modern American society. And you got some overlap between these two branches. For example, Carl Llewellyn, one of the leading legal realists, co-authored a book with an anthropologist named E. Adamson Hobel called The Cheyenne Way, which was a study of the rules and norms and social control among the Cheyenne people of the North American Plains. The Cheyenne way is quite different from the way of modern courts. Another bit of background comes within the field of sociology. Around the middle of the 20th century, studies of crime and deviance began to make more use of what's called the labeling approach. And in the labeling approach, unlike in traditional criminology where you ask, you know, why do people commit crimes? We have these social rules, don't steal, don't kill. Why do people steal and kill anyway? In the labeling approach, the focus is shifted away from the question of why people commit deviant acts to why some people are labeled deviant and others aren't, even if their behavior is basically the same. So you hear sociologists beginning to recognize that there's a lot of variation in who gets labeled deviant and that you can't explain all this variation with people's conduct. So some people steal but never get called thieves, they never get convicted of a crime, they never get called out on it. Other people might be falsely accused. They've never stolen or killed, but they still bear the label of killer and thief. An extreme example, and what's sort of the prototypical example of this labeling approach to deviance, is something like witchcraft trials and witch executions. You know, throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, and in many time periods and places around the world throughout history, people have been killed for witchcraft. They're accused of offenses like flying through the air at night on broomsticks and bringing supernatural curses to ruin their neighbor's crops. And this is a great example of how society can apply a deviant behavior that's not, you know, e explained by what people are actually doing. It's not explained by the alleged deviant's actual conduct because, you know, these crimes don't exist. No one's flying through the air on broomsticks. Witchcraft is a purely socially made up deviant label. So this is the sort of thing labeling theory drew our attention to, the fact that the alleged deviant's conduct is not enough to explain who gets labeled and who doesn't. This background influenced a sociologist named Donald Black, whose career began in the late 60s with the study of police. Black was one of the lead investigators in the Tri-State Police Study, a very large-scale study in which observers in three U.S. states rode around in police cars and recorded information on how police handled individual cases. So the police get called to a case of a domestic dispute or a street fight or an alleged theft. How do they actually respond? And there's a lot of variation in how they respond. They might make an arrest, they might let people off of a warning, they might try to informally settle a conflict and smooth things over. They might avoid the situation altogether and just drive on. They saw all these kinds of variation, and so Black set out to try to understand this variation by finding patterns in it. So for example, one pattern he thought he noticed early on was it seemed like there was an inverse relationship between police intervention 
and the availability of other kinds of informal social control. For example, juvenile law tends to be pretty lenient, and he noticed that you know, the police would arrest a juvenile offender who had been, you know, vandalizing something or stealing something, and rather than taking them back to the station to be processed, they'd hand them off to their parents and, you know, ask the parents to do the punishment. And he viewed this as basically, you know, extradition. The police were extraditing the deviant from their own authority of the U.S. legal system to the authority of their parents, an alternative system of social control. He also noticed other patterns, like cases between intimates, such as husbands and wives, were handled differently than cases between strangers, or that cases between people in poor and minority neighborhoods were handled differently than cases in middle-class neighborhoods. And these sorts of patterns became the basis of his general theory of law. Based on these observations and on that growing body of knowledge coming out of legal studies and anthropology and sociology, he sought to develop a new theory of law. This theory was published in the book Behavior of Law, which presents a general scientific sociological approach to explaining legal variation. General in that this is meant to explain behavior in all human societies, not just modern America, not just tribal societies, but any society with law, scientific in that it's concerned with explaining things, making testable hypotheses, and sociological in that it ignores psychology and biology and even you know, legal factors and looks at how the social factors in a case exert an influence. And the idea is that this theory is meant to explain legal variation at every stage from policing to the courtroom, to sentencing and all that. Now, the title of the book is The Behavior of Law, and this reflects the attitude with which it's written that law is a kind of natural phenomenon, much like electricity or magnetism or what have you, and it's something that we can explain in terms of its own behavior. And just like you could have more or less electric charge or magnetism in a situation, you could have more or less law in a situation. So a key concept in this theory is looking at law as a quantitative variable, looking at law as a quantitative variable. And we've already address this a little bit, talking about how you could have more law in some societies and others measured by things like the rate of litigation, or how some cases go further in the legal system than others, and you could think of this as the quantity of law being poured into the case. And this is basically how Black defines law. The quantity of law for him is the amount of governmental social control that a case attracts. So law is governmental social control, social control being any process of defining and responding to deviance. So if it's done by a government or involving a government, it's law. And the more governmental social control a case attracts, the more law there is. Meaning the more law gets invoked in the case, the more legal authority is poured into the case, the more law there is. This means a call to the police is more law than if there was no call to the police. If the police actually show up, that's more law still. If they make an arrest, that's more law than if they don't. The prosecutor brings heavy charges, that's more law than if the prosecutor brought less severe charges or dropped the charges altogether. Convictions, more law than acquittal. Severe punishments, more law than a lenient punishment. And you can think the same way for civil litigation. Filing a lawsuit's more law than if you never filed a lawsuit. Having your lawsuit dismissed is less law than if your lawsuit goes to court, and so on. He also talks about the style of law, but we won't get into that just yet. We'll save that for next week. So the quantity of law he proposes has predictable relationships to other aspects of the social world. So the idea is to try to explain the quantity of law by specifying which aspects of the social world lead a case to attract more law. And the idea here is that if you explain the quantity of law, you explain the behavior of anyone involved in bringing law into the case. So a case that's conducive to a large quantity of law, whatever social factors make that so, explain why someone would call the cops rather than not call the cops. But it also explains why the cops would make an arrest rather than not make an arrest, or why the prosecutor would choose to prosecute the case rather than drop the charges. The idea is that the behavior of all these people involved in a case, the victim, the police, the prosecutor, the judge or jury, they're all aspects of the quantity of law. You explain the quantity and you explain when people are likely to make different decisions, even if they're taking different roles in the case. So how do we explain the quantity of law? Well, the strategy of explanation in this theory, again, is purely sociological. It's meant to explain the quantity of law with the social factors involved in the case, and the term here is social structure. Each case has a social structure defined by the social relationships between everybody involved, whether they're intimates or strangers, members of the same cultural group or of different cultural groups, whether they're social equals or from different class backgrounds, 
These variables make the social structure of the case, and different case structures attract different quantities of law. In other words, the pattern of relationships between everybody involved affects how likely the case is to attract a high or low quantity of law. And in the next lecture, we'll talk about one of these variables, one of these aspects of case structure, social status, and its effects on the quantity of law.